welcome you to the second lesson as promised that I would have the first two lessons done in a single day. So here we're talking about the DC distributor. And this is just a recap of how the direct current system is with your DC as your main source going in one direction from the negative side through to your load and then coming back to your positive side. So in here, you've got the cables that are coming from your substation and we call those cables feeders. Then your distributors are going to be the cables to which our service main right at the end are being supplied from, which is your individual consumers are being connected to. So a distributor is in then effect connected at one or more points to your feeders. So if you can see with the distributors that we are seeing here, you can see that there's loads L1, L2, L3, and L4, and they are connected between two feeders, which is your positive and your negative feeder. And your servants mains are connected to your, never connected to your feeders, but they are connected straight to your, distributors. Then we have got really four general types of how the DC current distributors work. You've got one where you've got a distributor fed at one end. You've got one where you can have a distributor fed at both ends, such as in the diagram that we see here with the positive and the negative. Then you have a distributor that is fed at the center or you can have a ring distributors. And for the sake of this chapter, we are going to go and look at our ring distributors because we are still driving that thing that says we want our systems to be reliable. So rings we have learned are a reliable source of supply. So if a feeder gets connected, the current in that section supplied by the disconnected feeder must still be supplied through other feeders and distributors. And that is what we are wanting. So as you can easily see that we've got a ring system in here going from A through to B, C, D, and then back at A. Now, because it's DC, what really you would have had here is a scenario where you're moving from A to B, and then you're moving from A to C, and then A to D. Then you also have a point whereby you are feeding C from B directly, and a point whereby you are feeding o, D from C directly. And because of this scenario, instead of us having all of these different connectors or distributors in the system they decided to bring it up and make those two points join in one area by having this ring system being in place and this advantage is that by suitable choice of your feeding points where they are you could obviously have a greater economy in your copper that you're using in the system your line lengths might be shorter than you going from a to d and then going from you know a to c directly because now at least you're going just from a to b and just d to a and the other ones you're going to have shorter lines going in between you don't have to travel all the way there now, our simplest case of a ring distributor is one where we only have one feeding point, as you can see there. So our A is our feeding point in this case. Then you've got your lows that are tapped from your B point, your C point, and your D point. So your lows are represented by that IB, that IC, and that ID in this case. So we say that this ring distributor is equivalent to a straight distributor that could have been fed at both ends with equal voltages. So sometimes a ring distributor has a severe large area that it needs to service, and that may lead it to having excessive voltage drops within the system. 
And the way to reduce those voltage drops is for us to then introduce an interconnector where you can now have the distant points of the distributor linked through an interconnector. So you could have one coming from A all the way to C, which is the furthest way, or you could even have an interconnector coming through other substations where you've got more than just three loads that are coming out of here. So the current flows in one direction because it's a DC system and it's constant or should be constant throughout our circuit. And because of this, we can utilize what we call Kirchhoff's voltage law. And that really says that the algebraic sum of all our voltages in a loop must be equal to zero. So the introduction of the interconnector in order to reduce your voltage drop where you've got huge distribution systems in here is that it uses the Thevenin's theorem for voltage resistance and current. And that theorem simply states that any complicated network across its load terminals can be substituted by the voltage drop, the voltage source with one resistance in series. And that theorem is used with the interconnector as an open circuit conductor. And the overall voltage drop then of that system at various points can be seen to be reduced from a system that had no interconnector in it. So now we're going to go into the exercises. Now in the textbook, there is also examples that are utilized and I didn't put the ones in the textbook here. I just went and I did exercises right at the back of the chapter. But if you guys want to practice some more and you do not have access to the textbook and you would like me to scan those examples and send to you, please let me know. I will be able to make sure that I scan them somehow as I can't get into campus at the moment, but I will scan them and send them off to the group as well. So the very first example shows us that we've got a two-wire DC ring distributor and our DC systems always are two-wired because there is a positive and a negative wire that are running from your source. So they say that this distributor is 840 meters which means from your source point going around to your different loads which in this case there's three loads you see there which is 118 136 and 168 amps that means it's b c and d point so going around to those loads and then coming all the way back again at a where your voltage source of 260 is at that is where your 840 is compromised off then they go ahead and they give you specific distances and not my word of specific distances. They say that point B, which is your first load point, is 240 meters from our feeding point, which is A. From, from A to B is 240 meters. And then they say point C is 510 meters from the feeding point, not from point B but from the feeding point. In other words, to get the actual distance between B and C, you must take the 510 and subtract the 240. Then you will get the distance between o, B and C. Then they say, and our point D is 250 meters from the feeding point in the opposite direction. So it means that I don't go in the same direction that I went from A to go to B and B to go to C. But I take it directly from D at the bottom of how they have been drawing this ring system. And I make that 250 meters. And you can see that from the way that they've given these distances, you must always try and draw it out and do the calculation and put it into the actual drawing. And you will see if you do so that there is no distance given between your point C and your point D. 
So therefore, now that you've got all of your distances between A and B, being the 240, between B and C, being the 510 minus the 240, and between A and D being the 250, you can simply add those three distances up and take the 840 and minus those three distances. And that will give you the distance between your point C and D. And so therefore, it also gives you the resistance of a single conductor, okay? And that is 0 0.28 ohms per thousand meters of distribution cable. So now they say we must calculate the current at each section of the distributor, as well as calculate the voltage at each point. So let's go and do one, and then we're going to come back and do two and three. So when we come and we're doing O exercise 7.1, I have now drawn the network in. So there is the 240, there is the 510 minus the 240 is 270, and there is the 250 that they were referring to. Then taking those three distances and subtracting them from the 840, I got the 80 meters, which I then got and drew between your C and your D point. I also show all the loads that they gave you, and I show them taking off there, and I show that my source is the 260. So when they say draw the network, this is what is expected of you when you draw the network. Then you've been given that the resistance of a single conductor is 0 0.28. So if you want the resistance of the actual um, conductors, then you can have that 2 multiplied by that, that 0 0.28, and then you can simply divide it by that 1,000. And that will give you the 0 0.56 times 10 to the minus 3. Then you can go and start calculating all of your different resistances. So for the first part, you've got the 0 0.56 and you multiplied by the 240 meters between your A and your B point. And therefore, the resistance at that point is given by that 0 0.1344. You do the same for your point B to C, your point C to D, and your point D back to A. Then after you've got all those four resistances per section of that ring system, you go and use the Kirchhoff's voltage law that says the voltage within that system, the sum of it will equate to zero. And so therefore, you know that the voltage is going to be my VAB plus my VBC plus my VCD plus my VDA. That equals to zero. And you simply write those voltages in terms of your current and your resistance. So VAB, for example, is going to be IAB, RAB. Then your VBC is going to be IBC, RBC. And so it goes. Then you need so that you can solve because you don't have any of these currents. Okay. You don't have an IAB. You don't have an IBC. You don't have an ICD. And you do not have an IDA. The currents you have are current at B, the current at C, and the current at D. So you have to find all these currents within your interconnector. So how do you go about doing it? Not your interconnector, sorry me, within your ring system. So you make one of these the subject or what you want to solve for first, and then you can go and solve all of your other currents as well. So if I look at what makes up my very first current in there, which is IAB, what is IAB? And you can see all these reds at the bottom where I have drawn it for you so that you can see per node what IAB is going to be. And you can see that at B, you've got IAB going in, and then you've got the 118, which is IB going out, and you've got the IBC that is coming out. So therefore, 
if I write my IBC, I can say it actually equals to my IAB minus my IB, which is minus 118. I now can leave the IAB, RAB, and I go to where I had my IBC and I substitute by this IAB minus 118. Then I go to my node C. If I go to my node C, I've got IBC coming in at that node. And then coming out of that node, I've got the 136, which is IC. And then I've got the ICD coming out. So here now I must make my ICD the subject of the formula. So therefore my ICD simply equals to my IBC and I subtract my IC, which is 136. I have already written IBC as IAB minus 118 on the previous node. So I substitute that in there and I will simply have then ICD being equal to IAB minus my 118 that I had as IBC and then I also subtract this 136 from this node which you can simplify further and say it's simply IAB minus 254. Then your last node you're going to is going to be your node D. And at your node D, you also have those scenarios where you've got your ICD coming into that node and leaving that node, you've got two current, which is ID at 168, and then you've got IDA that is leaving. So you make IDA your subject, and therefore it's going to be equal to ICD minus IC. You already have ICD in the previous node written out as IAB minus 254. So you put that in and then you subtract this 168, which you can then simplify further and say it is IAB minus 422. So go put all of those currents then into your catch-ups voltage law and solve for IAB. Once you've sold for IAB, you can then simply go and plug it into all those different nodes so that you get your IBC and you get your ICD and lastly you get your IDA. And they have done it like that. So go to your calculator and you can just double check that you are getting the same values that I am. Then the second part of the question was for you to find the voltages at all the different nodes. So you have to find the voltage at VB, you have to find the voltage at VC, and you have to find the voltage at VD. So for VB voltage, the first one is your first node. It's simply going to be my supply point or my supply voltage and I subtract the voltage drop on that portion of the line going from the supply up to B point. And that will give me what voltage I can then get at B point. And say so therefore I know my VA was sitting at 260. VAB I know can simply be IAB. RAB. I've got my IAB that I just worked out. I know what my RAB is, so therefore I can get what my VB is. Then you go to your C node and you're working out for your VC. And your VC will really simply be that voltage that you had before, which was the voltage at node B. And then you subtract with the voltage drop that you had going from your node B towards your node C. And you already have IBC as well from the previous question, so therefore you can be able to work out VC. Then for VD, there is two ways you can do it. You can either do it from the voltage from your C node, which was VC that you just got previously, and you subtract the voltage drop across your VCD section. Or as a second alternative, you can actually take the voltage of your supply point, which was VA, 
and you add because you're going in the opposite direction to the arrow of your current in this case you add the voltage drop of vda and that will actually get you to have the same answer for vd so irregardless of which of the two you utilize you get to the same answer then we go to 7.2 so in 7.2 unlike in 7.1 where they gave us lots of distances here they gave you the resistances between all of your different nodes so you've got from a to b from b to c from c to d and from d back to a they gave you a voltage of 220 volts and then they say that you've got your ib your ic and your id sitting at 45 68 and 92 amps then you take that and you go back to the ketchup's voltage law and per node you work it out such that you work it according to trying to solve for iab once you have all of that you solve for iab like we did before and then you can then go to IBC, ICD, and IDA. You have that sorted, just like you did then in 7.1, you can calculate the voltages at each of those node points. So this is the first part was just like you did 7.1, nothing different. What now gets different is that they introduce an int and they put this interconnector to be between your source and your far end load, which is your node at C. So there's an interconnector, it's in red in here, and it's introduced at 0 0.056 ohms. And because we said we're gonna use Thevenin's theorem and open circuit that interconnector, which talks about the voltage drop across that, it means that our V Thevenin is simply gonna be that voltage across A and C where the interconnector is at. Now we know that at A is 220, we worked out VC in the previous number, which was 7.2.1. We plug that in and we can see that our VAC is going to be this value of 6.9399 volts. Then, because we've open circuited the interconnector, it means that we can see for our R Thevenin that you're going to have the upper part of your resistances being parallel to the ones that are at your bottom part. Simply, it means your RAB plus RBC becomes parallel to your RDA plus RCD. You work out what that is going to be, and it gives you the 0 0.0508. Then we said, because of the Thevenin's theorem, where we are now going to have a resistance we introduced in series, it means that when I go and work out my current now over that IAC or the interconnector, I put in that V Thevenin that I had, which is VAC, I divide by this RTH and I add in series that interconnector resistance at 0 0.056. That gives me then the current which I call my IAC. Then I can be able to go and put this into the Kirchhoff's voltage law. And I pick a side that I want to work in. Either I take the bottom part or I take the top part. So we've taken the top part in this example. You can try it at home taking the bottom triangle as well. So that top part is then between A, B, C and back to A. Then I use the Ketchoff's voltage law. And I say that my zero is going to be my IABRAB plus RBCIBC. 
Then for where my interconnector is at, going back to my source, I'm no longer adding it, but I am subtracting it because by default, that voltage drop is what I'm saying is equal to these two. Then I go and I work out what my IAB is. And you can see it's not the same as your previous one. Then having done the IAB, I can be able to substitute and work out my IBC. And I can then work out what my ICD is because I know my ICD should just be a simple factor. If I go back to my note C, you can see in note C, I now have got two incomers and two outgoing. Instead of the previous question one, where I had one incomer and two outgoing. So my incomers are IBC and ICA, then my outgoing are IC and ICD. So if I can then be able to write what ICD is going to be. And I can do the same thing by going to note D and be able to give me my IDA current. And then having all of those currents, I can then work out the voltages again at each of my nodes because that is what we want. And I want you to go back and look at the slide before and you can do this by just downloading this from um, Wise Up. Look at my VAB now at 217.48 and look at my VAB before I put in the interconnector. Then go to my VC and go to my VD and tell me what you notice. Note it down. What do you notice? Because it might just be one of the questions that you get asked. What is the advantage of adding the interconnector into the system? And you need to have been something that you actually saw yourself. Okay, then this is the last example that we do on the DC system. And what is different about this example is that now you have got four loads instead of three loads that you had previously. Other than that, it's exactly the same as the previous one. The difference is you must recognize that you've given four currents here. So it means you've got four loads that you have. So it's going to be B, C, D, and E. So it also then obviously states that your distances, the way that they have been set out, you must go and be able to put them all between those points and you will see which point does not have a distance. You take the overall distance and you minus the points distances that you have and you will be able to get that other distance. So they also gave you here a resistance for your conductor. Pair conductor, remember it's a two-wire system, it's a DC system. So they gave you that resistance to be 0 0.32. You can immediately, without even having done anything else, Go and work out what does it mean the resistance of the system is by just multiplying that by two and dividing it by that thousand so that you've got your ohms per meters. Then you can be able to multiply per section by the meters that you have been given to find what your RAB, RBC, RCD, etc. are going to be. Then you go like you've been doing before. Nothing is different. It's just that you've got an additional load different. Ne? So you go again using Kirchhoff's voltage law and you go and you work out IAB first. You find IAB, then you go and substitute it and you just go per node. You don't even have to memorize this. You must be able to draw per node. At B point, what do I have? At B point, I've got an incomer which is coming from my supply side. I've got an outgoing to go to B load. Then I've got an outgoing that is going to my C node. And you just keep on doing those and then you're able to work out what all of those currents in that distribution are going to be. So in this example, I don't finish it. After you've worked out the voltages per node, I then have added that interconnector that they say we must add. 
there's also a difference on my interconnector. And what is that difference? The interconnector is not coming from my supply point, but instead, in this case, is coming from my B load and is going towards my D load. It still works as an interconnector. And I've been given the resistance for it as well. Sorry about that disturbance. And then so you are able to then find all of your different voltages as well at those nodes. Then once you've now put in the ETA connector, just like we did there, you utilize the Thevenin's equivalent circuit where you are going to open circuit this interconnector. And in this case, you can obviously see that your parallel circuits are going to be the 290 of BC plus the 280 of CD. And then that should be parallel to the 280 of AB, the 300 of AD, and the 300 of DE. Then you work out what that RT would be. And you also get the voltage between your B and your D point by just simply taking the two voltages and minusing them. So I don't want you to be shocked because it doesn't seem to be from the supply point. And obviously you can guess what is coming. And that is I want you to finish off number three after the voltages which are shown on the next slide.